All right, it is one, we can start. Hello everyone again. Nice to see you for this fourth session of the Tour de France from A to Z. Uh, for the ones who don't know me, uh, I'm Emily. I'm a library associate at the Princeton Public Library. Uh, and so I've been the presenter of the Tour de France series uh, since the first session, mid-June. Um, so as a reminder, this session is being recorded. You will find it in a few days uh, in, on the YouTube channel of the Princeton Public Library. Uh, I've been told that the one from last week hasn't been put on YouTube yet, but it should be so in just a few days, the time for uh, one colleague to actually come back from vacation. So like yeah, you will find uh, all the presentations uh, very soon on the YouTube channel uh, of the Princeton Public Library. All right, so today we are going to talk about Ile de Ré, Joyeuse and Kourou. So starting with the Ile de Ré, which is an island uh, very close to mainland France uh, that belongs to the Charente region, region that extends from about this area over here. So it's located between Bordeaux over here and Angers over here. So two cities we talked about uh, in the first presentation. So this one is really in between. All right, so Ile de Ré is uh, an island, as I said. Um, so it's about 25 kilometers long. It hosts about 18,000 inhabitants uh, who live there per year. And during the high season in summer, it can actually host 10 times as many people. Uh, so it's a very touristic place uh, and it's composed of about 10 villages uh, along the whole, uh, scattered along the whole uh, island. So what's interesting about this place is that its volume actually changes depending on the tide. Uh, uh, when it's uh, high tide, uh, some of the land is actually hidden by the sea and as the water recedes, the, the island increases in volume. So it's nicknamed Reza White uh, because of its traditional white houses. You can see a, a few over there from these pictures. And even though it's a tiny island, it offers quite a wide ranges of landscapes from sand beaches, pebble beaches, and as well marshes, dunes, and cliffs. Um, and it's actually the fourth biggest island of mainland France. So I'm not counting the overseas territory, only mainland France. So it's the fourth biggest island in terms of surface area, not population. The first one being Corsica, the second one, Ile d'Oléron, just south of the Ile de Ré, and the third one, Belle-Île in Brittany. Um, so it offers more than 100 kilometers of cycling trails. Uh, so yeah, across the island. So cycling is very popular in the island. And I would say it's not only nice to uh, cycle over there. It's also a necessity, especially in summer, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as uh, during the peak season, 10 times as many tourists arrive on the island. Just imagine if about 100,000 cars just like drive on this 20 kilometer, like 15 mile land, it would be quite impossible to just like drive around there. So it's way nicer to just like, go there by just bike on the island uh, on a on a daily basis. So it's connected uh, to mainland France by a three kilometer long bridge. Um, and so it's connected to uh, the city of La Rochelle in France. And before uh, the bridge was built in 1988, you actually had to take a ferry to cross the sea from the Ile de Ré to mainland France. So what can you do when you are on the Ile de Ré? First, you can definitely have a stroll on the numerous beaches uh, that you can find on the island. So half of the 100 kilometer coast of the Ile de Ré is actually beaches. So yeah, 50 kilometers, 30 miles uh, of beaches all across the island. Uh, most of the beaches are located on the southwest coast. So if we take the map, oh, sorry. If we take the map again, so like yeah, you will find actually most of the beaches over there uh, with a few in the north, but uh, most of the beaches of the Ile de Ré are located in, in this area in the southwest. Uh, 
So you can either like have a nice bath, have a stroll on the beach, or you can try uh, surfing, kite surfing and windsurfing, which are very popular spots in the area. Uh, the Grenet Beach is actually a very good uh, spot for that. Uh, if you've seen that movie, some scenes of the longest day uh, that was released in 1962, starring uh, Henry Fonda, John Wayne and Robert Mitchum, were shot on the Ildore beaches. Uh, I think on Riverdu Beach, uh, once again, if we take the map, so yeah, on Riverdu Plage and as well at uh, Les Portes Henri. So some scenes of um, the longest day have been shot over there. Not the whole movie, only, only a few scenes. After a stroll on the beach, you can aim to uh, Lilo de Nige National Natural Reserve, uh, which is about 120 hectares, 300 acres um, uh, large. So it's mostly composed of salt marshes and mud flats, uh, where a lot of uh, birds, uh, migrating birds, are stopping by. So if you are uh, a bird watching lover, that would be a very good place for you to go to. You would see a lot of different bird species. Uh, so in this natural reserve, you can go to the House of the Bay Museum if you want to find some more information about local bio biodiversity and uh, the ecosystem diversity that you can find on the island. So from the, the dunes, the salt marshes, the forests and foreshore that you can find on the Ile de Ré. So this, uh, this natural reserve is actually uh, managed by the League for Bird Protection, uh, which offers walks to go bird watching uh, in the in the natural reserve. So over there, you would see. So as I said, so this is an example of salt marsh right here. There. And so, if you go bird watching, you would see some herons, some egrets, uh, but as well red shanks, black black wing stilts, and many species of ducks. If you go to, uh, so after going to uh, the natural reserve, you can aim to the Wales Lighthouse. Uh, I skipped one, sorry. So the Wales Lighthouse, which is located at the very west extremity of the island. Uh, it's about 57 meter high, uh, about a bit less than 200 feet. And it's actually among the highest French lighthouses. If you're willing to, you can climb the 257 steps to go to the top where you will have a very nice view over the whole island and also over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, unfortunately, there's no elevator, so you have to be quite fit to climb to the top. Uh, it was inaugurated in 1854 and is still in use today. Uh, and its light can actually be seen from around 50 kilometers, so like a 30 miles around. Uh, so right next to this lighthouse, you will have find an old tower, uh, which was the previous lighthouse that was built in uh, 1682 and that and which was in use until 1854, the year of the construction of the uh, bigger lighthouse, the Wales Lighthouse. At the bottom of the old tower, you can find a museum about the history of those two lighthouses, where you will find as well uh, some models uh, of those two constructions and of the island. So like yeah, here you have a picture with the big whale lighthouse and the old tower right over there with the museum at the bottom of the old tower. Uh, so if you want to go back to a, an urban area, you could cross the bridge and go to La Rochelle, uh, which is a very cute city. I've been there only once uh, for only one night a few years ago, and I really love the vibe, even though I stayed for a very short amount of time. Um, so it's been a very important port since the 12th century. Uh, as it was one of the main gateways to the ocean. So you can still find a fishing port, a trade port, and a yachting port in La Rochelle. Uh, if you go, if you have a nice walk in Old Town, so you would find half timbered houses, a Grosse Horloge clock tower that uh, was 
basically limiting uh, that was the limit between uh, the ports and the city. You could see gargoyles uh, and 18th century ship owners mansions. Uh, you could go to the port as well and visit both three towers over here. So the St. Nicholas Tower, uh, which was a military building and is about 40 meter high or like 150 feet high. The chain tower that was used to monitor traffic and to collect taxes back in the day. And the lantern tower that used to be a lighthouse and the prison which is about 55 meter high or like more or less 200 feet. So the three towers received the historical mu uh, monument labels uh, in 1879. And it's possible to visit the three of them. If you like to see fish from um, just like in a tank, uh, you can go to the aquarium where you will find more than 600 species and 12,000 marine animals. La Rochelle's aquarium is actually one of the biggest European aquarium. I haven't visited it, but it's apparently quite impressive. So even though La Rochelle is a relatively small island, it offers an it, the island and its whereabouts offer quite a few festivals all year round, starting with the Francophonie de la Rochelle, which is a music festival dedicated to Francophone uh, musicians uh, that usually happens in La Rochelle uh, mid July. Uh, so then we have Musique en Ré, which is a classical music festival that usually happens at the end of July to early August with some free outdoor concerts. Uh, and in parallel, you have Jazz of Far, which is a jazz festival that usually happens so at the same uh, at the same time, so late July to early August. Uh, this one takes place at the bottom and around the way lit lighthouse. And the Oléron Durable Festival. Uh, so this one is happening on the Oléron Island, so uh, the island right south of the Ile de Ré. Uh, so it's a one day festival, usually early July, which evolves around sustainability with workshops, performances, conferences and exhibitions about sustainability. So what can you eat uh, in, when you are in La Rochelle? So first, uh, I want to mention that uh, oysters uh, are found in, uh, in, on the Ile de Ré you can actually find 62 oyster farms around the island. So a question for you, uh, what is the average quantity of oysters produced on the Ile de Ré per year? Just like give a number either on the chat or you can unmute yourself. No, no one wants to, all right. I'll say over a million. So, no, so like, yeah, um, sorry. Uh, so not a number of oysters, but more like a, a weight, uh, weight quantity, sorry. I should have been more precise. So if you're saying a million oysters, like how, how much weight do you think it, it would stand for? I don't like. I don't have an actual number of oysters, uh, but uh, when it comes to so six thousand pounds, so yeah, it's actually six thousand tons of uh, oysters that are produced per year in, on average on the Ile de Ré. Absolutely, yeah. All right. So I guess you were waiting for the moment when I would talk to you about. <laughs> snail dishes, so that's today. So uh, a specialty from the Ile de Ré is cagouille. So cagouille is actually a word to designate a specific variety of snail, which is escargot petit gris, so little gray snails. So for this dish, you boil uh, the snails in a broth in which you add white wine, tomato, garlic, and soft bread, and sometimes pieces of pork too. Uh, mussel éclade. So éclade is more a cooking technique than a dish. Uh, so this cooking technique actually comes from the Oléron Island, so right south of the of the Ile de Ré, as I said earlier. 
So it consists of actually stacking the muscles on a piece of wood. You cover the muscles with pine needles and then you set fire to those pine needles. And so the, the fire will actually heat and cook the muscles and the, the pine needles will give them uh, a very smoky area, very quite specific. I've never tried, but I would be very, very curious to try because I absolutely love muscles and with a smoky flavor, it must be quite delicious. Then chaudrée. So I think you know this one. So it's a fish soup with crustacean and shellfish. Uh, so in the, Charent, uh, in the Charent region, this is the recipe uh, it's usually made of. So shellfish, uh, bacon, vegetables, potatoes, white wine, herbs, cream, milk, and butter. So when French people emigrated to the US and Canada in the 17th century, they imported the dish with them which is known uh, in the United States as chowder. So if you ever wonder where chowder came from, actually from the Atlantic coast, including the Ile d'Oré. And so Gornuel is a biscuit with anise seeds or small anise candies made in the Charente area, usually eaten around Easter. So what can you drink uh, with, all the, with all that food? So uh, on the Ile de Ré, there are actually 65 wine growers. Uh, Cistercian monks have grown vines since the 12th century. And the Ile de Ré produced about 2 million bottles per year, at least for the last few years. So from red, rosé, white, sparkling, like every kind of wine. And so from the, the very specialty from uh, the Ile de Ré and the Charente area is the Pinot. So it's a vin de liqueur, so wine fortified with brandy. Uh, so a mix of grape must and brandy, as I just said. Uh, so it can be white, rosé, red as well. You would usually drink that as an aperitif before the meal, uh, not necessarily during the meal. Uh, as a digestive, you can uh, have a tiny glass of cognac after, after your meal. So cognac is a kind of brandy produced in the cognac area, which is about 100 kilometers away from the Ile de Ré uh, in the east. Uh, so it's produced with uh, specific white grapes that grow in the cognac area. And those grapes are distilled twice and then aged at least two years in oak barrels. And then, at, if you want, like before going to bed, you can have a brûlot charentais. So it's basically a coffee flambé with cognac in a stoneware cup. So if you put a tiny bit of cognac in your coffee and then uh, place a couple of sugar cubes in bibe with cognac on the cup's plate, you can then um, light up the plate and the, the fire is actu will actually heat the coffee and uh, give it a special taste as well. All right, so now we can go to Joyeuse. So I chose this city because, to be honest, there are not that many cities that start with J in France. Uh, but for me, it was the perfect excuse to talk more broadly about the Ardèche area, which is absolutely beautiful. So Ardèche uh, extends about over here. Uh, so Joyeuse actually means happy in French. And according to a legend, it would take its name from Charle King Charlemagne's sword. So apparently, uh, King Charlemagne uh, one day lost his sword called Joyeuse while he was hunting. And so he promised uh, to the person who would find it uh, land and as well, he would give this person and the, the uh, and this person's hairs, uh, the name of his sword, so Joyeuse. The, the village was actually found, founded in 802. Um, so it's quite a, a small village, about 1,700 inhabitants live there. Um, so yeah, part of the original town fortifications dating from the 14th century can also seen, can be seen around Joyeuse medieval center and actually a 16th century castle hosts the city hall. Uh, so Ardèche is actually one of the least densely populated departments in France. 
Uh, most of its inhabitants live in the countryside. Uh, it's quite wild, uh, offers a lot of natural areas like forests, mountains, canyons, caves, a very uh, varied range of landscapes. So if you're a nature lover, Ardèche would be perfect for you. I went there only once uh, for a weekend, but, and it was like, yeah, it was really gorgeous. I, I loved it. So when you are in Ardèche, you could uh, go to the Paioli Woods, which is a six square mile oak forest in the south of Ardèche, which is a protected natural area, or sorry, a protected natural area. Uh, so uh, in this oak forest, you will find a kind of labyrinth of limestone rocks with enigmatic shapes. For example, with a bit of imagination, you can think that maybe a bear is fighting with a lion. So like yeah, uh, across the natural reserve, you would see some actually naturally shaped, like not man, like shaped by man hand, uh, like a yeah, very enigmatic uh, rock shapes. Um, so locals call it the forest of the fairies. So fados for fairies. And the Paioli woods are the habitat of many different animal species like falcons, eagles, beetles, beavers, and bats. Then you could go to the Gorge de l'Ardèche, which is nicknamed the European, European Grand Canyon. So it's the gorge uh, stretch for about 30 kilometers, like 19 miles. Uh, it's a famous uh, place to canoe and, and kayak uh, and attract over a million visitors per year. Uh, so at the entrance, at the north entrance of the series of gorges, uh, you would find this arch right here, which is called Pont d'Arc. So it's about 60 meter wide, about 200 feet, and 54 meter high, like 180 feet. Uh, and so to give you a better idea, so yeah, that's the kind of view that you could have from like the, the top of the gorges. So. Um, so the only time that I went to Ardèche, it was for a wedding. Uh, this wedding was happening uh, in a resort. And from this resort, there were like a series of stairs that led directly to the gorges. And I was very astonished by the, the beauty of the place. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, if you are interested in pre prehistoric art, you should go to the Grotchove 2 Ardèche. So um, it's called Grotchove number two because uh, it's a replica of a cave that was uh, discovered in 1994 um, in the gorges of Ardèche that uh, I just talked to you uh, right before. So the the Original cave uh, was discovered on December 18th, 1994, by three speleologists, including Jean-Marie Chauvet, who gave his name to, to the cave. And it is considered one of the most significant prehistoric art sites with cave paintings that date from uh, 32,000 to 30,000 BC. Uh, you may have heard um, the another uh, cave name, the Lascaux Cave. Which, uh, which is another very famous cave that was discovered in the 1940s. Uh, so to give you an idea, the paintings that were found in the Lascaux caves were actually more recent than those ones uh, because they date from the uh, 17,000 BC. So the, the paintings that uh, that have been found in the Chauvet cave are unique. Uh, they are the, the only ones so far that have been found that are so, so old. So uh, when people discovered that cave, that uh, they were able to see some uh, paintings of many different animals like horses, bisons, rhinos, uh, cave lions, and so on, uh, as well as, and they found as well 4,000 uh, inventory remains of prehistoric pre fauna and variety of human footprints. So to make uh, the replica of, uh, of this cave, uh, so the people who built the, the new cave uh, 
basically uh, used the exact same techniques, painting techniques that were used in the cave. Uh, for example, like a charcoal drawing, engraving, like fingertips painting, and they played with the volumes as well of the walls um, to give volumes to the paintings. Um, and so, yeah, they made the replica mostly to preserve the original cave uh, and it starts that's very, very fragile. Um, so, yeah, the original cave was actually sealed off to the public a, a bit after it was discovered at the end of 1994. So, like, yeah, and while they were uh, recreating the paintings as well, they uh, decided the people who uh, built the Grotschove number no. two. Uh, recreated as well the atmosphere that you could find uh, in the in the original cave. So with the original level of humidity, the original temperature, level of darkness, and acoustics. So even though it's not the actual cave, I think it's really worth going there uh, because it, it's quite impressive. Then if you want to take a hike, uh, you can go to the Parc Naturel Régional des Monts d'Ardèche, uh, which stretches for about 100 kilometer uh, in the west part of Ardèche. So for uh, it, it covers uh, an 80, 880 square mile area. Uh, so it offers 4,000 kilometers of hiking trails. So the possibilities are quite endless here. Uh, it offer, it's the habitat of 2,800 different animal species like birds, mammal insects, some of them uh, being very rare, like very, uh, like very rare uh, species of eagles, of beetles. Uh, so this mountain range is uh, not very high. It's like yeah, medium mountains. It's highest peak, the Mont Mézinc, um, culminates at 1,753 meters, so roughly 5,500 feet. Um, and so another summit that's quite interesting is the Mont Gerbier de Jon, which is a bit lower than that, uh, 1,500 meters, like yeah, roughly 5,000 feet, which is actually the source of the Loire River and was a, was a volcano. Uh, if you want to climb up this one, it's quite a short hike it's only 30 to take you about 30 minutes to climb to the top and from the top of the Mont Javier de Jean you would have a view over the Alps uh, the Rhone Valley and the massive central volcanoes that I mentioned in a previous session and so in this area as well uh, you can find 50 extinct volcanoes the all right, so in this area, uh, if you want to find some events, so you can go to Joyeuse Escale. So it's a four day festival in Joyeuse uh, that usually happens in May. It's organized by uh, Allo La Planète Web Radio. Web Radio. Uh, and this festival is about travel and expatriation. So there would be movie screenings, conferences, workshops, concerts, and exhibitions about traveling. La Beaumont Music is a music festival, uh, mostly classical music um, with like movie, like yeah, uh, uh, movie score, uh, world music as well that happens in different cities and, vill and villages across Ardèche. Uh, usually this one happens the first half of June. The Festival d'Alba is a performing arts festival like theater, circus and music and is organized every uh, year uh, in July since 2009. And the Castagnade is, um, I would say, uh, an event to promote local producers and artisans and artists with uh, food tasting exhibitions and performances. So this Castagnade is actually an event that's common to a lot of villages in Ardèche, and they evolve around chestnuts which is uh, widely cultiv and cultivated in Ardèche. And so from, uh, so chestnut is uh, called châtaigne in French and like castagne is actually a, der a derivative name uh, from châtaigne. So like yeah, these events is actually uh, common to a dozen villages in, in Ardèche. 
So talking about chestnuts, uh, crème de marron is uh, a specialty from the area. It's basically a chestnut spread uh, or jam, kind of jam actually, uh, made uh, with like yeah, chestnut jam and a tiny bit of marron glacé as well and uh, a hinge of uh, pinch of vanilla. It was invented at the end of the 19th century. Uh, picodon is a kind of cheese, so it's a goat milk cheese. Uh, it actually means spicy in Occitan, which is a local dialect spoken in the area. Uh, so it is not pasteurized and have a spicy flavor, as its name indicates. Uh, maosh is a stuffed pork stomach with cabbage, potatoes, sausage meats, prune, carrots, spiced with... Uh, and so yeah, this dish is spiced with juniper berries. And creek, I would say that it's the kind of um, an equivalent of the tortilla de patatas from Spain. So it's an omelette made of sliced potatoes, parsley, and eggs. So now we're moving to the other side of the world, uh, to the to South America. Uh, we're going to Guyana, French Guyana. So this is the only uh, overseas territory that is actually on the South American continent not an island. So Kourou is um, a city that is about, that is located on the coast of French Guiana, about 60 kilometers away from Cayenne, which is French Guiana's biggest city. You have heard the word Cayenne before. Yes, it's actually uh, related to the Cayenne pepper, uh, which is uh, cultivated in, in this area. So about 25,000 people live in Kourou, uh, which makes it one of the biggest cities of French Guiana as well. Uh, so in Kourou, uh, so Kourou is actually hosting the Guiana Space Center. Uh, so French Guiana more broadly was a penal colony from uh, the mid middle of the 19th century until the middle of the 20th century. And Kourou was uh, Kourou's penitentiary opened in 1856. Almost all of the territory of French Guiana is covered by tropical forests. Uh, most of the seas actually are located on the coast. You will find a few uh, other cities in the forest, but really most of them are located on the coast. And French Guianese Creole is uh, the most spoken language in French Guiana. So when you are in Guyane, and especially in Kourou, you could try to go to the Salvation Island, Salvation Island sorry. So uh, the Salvation Islands are located uh, about 14 kilometers, seven nautical miles north of Kourou uh, in the ocean. Uh, so uh, Salvation Island are, are three small volcan volcanic islands, Devil Island, St. Joseph Island, and Royal Island. There are they take its name from um, a time when uh, French settlers uh, actually went to uh, this tiny piece of land to escape diseases on the mainland in the 18th century. Uh, right now, only St. Joseph and Royal Islands are accessible. Uh, you would find a lot of animals on Royal Islands like parrots, monkeys, iguanas, sea turtles, uh, and on St. Joseph Island, you would find prison cell rooms. So Salvation Islands are uh, the site uh, of the remnants of a very harsh penal colony that was built in the 19th century. Uh, it actually opened in 1854 on the Salvation Island. And it was actually was one, sorry, it, um, the penal colony over there was one uh, among the harshest uh, because of the violence uh, of the guards to the inmates, uh, because of the tropical diseases that just circulated between the inmates um, and the terrible living conditions. Like uh, about 70,000 inmates went through there in total and they would like stay in cells that had no roof, but just like metal grids. Uh, and if you ever heard about um, Alfred Dreyfus, uh, who was the um, 
uh, main uh, figure concern in the Jacques case. So Alfred Dreyfus was actually sent to uh, this penal colony in 1894 after being wrongly accused of espionage. And so Alfred Dreyfus stayed on Devil, Devil Island. If you are interested in that uh, part of history, um, you could read and watch Papillon, so a book written by Henri Charrière in 1969 uh, that was actually adapted in movies two times, once in 1973, uh, starring Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman, and a more recent uh, version uh, dates from 2017 uh, with Charlie Hunnam and Rami Malek. Uh, and so actually Henri Charrière uh, passed through uh, this penal colony too and was sent from the Ile de Ré to Guyane in 1933 uh, after being wrongly accused of killing a man in 1927. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in Guyane's penal colony uh, and he managed to escape, which was very, very rare. Uh, and so access to Devil Island is now forbidden because of strong and dangerous currents, so you can't go there only to St. Joseph and Royal Islands. So you could uh, as well go to the Space Museum and Guyana Space Center if you go to Kourou. Uh, so the museum was inaugurated in 1996 and has attracted about 23,000 visitors per year uh, until 2022. So it's currently being renovated. So if you go to Guyana, you maybe should postpone it to the end of 2023, especially if you want to visit the Space Museum uh, as it's not open right now. Uh, so apparently its uh, focus will shift uh, and become an, inter an, inter uh, an interpretation center, sorry, uh, focused on the Guyana Space Center missions and projects. Uh, while before uh, it's uh, exhibition was actually uh, more focused on the American and Russian space conquest. So now it will be more related to the European, I would say, uh, point of view and missions, and as well it's uh, linked to the territory of French Guiana and its uh, relation to the and to its inhabitants. So it's actually possible to visit the Guyana Space Center um, and the different spaces, uh, spaces like the control center, the launch pad, and other installations uh, for three-hour uh, visits. If you're looking for uh, something more for a wilder area to go to, uh, you can go to the creek and prepare pre pre sorry. So it's a protected natural area of about 37,000 uh, acres. Uh, so it's mostly composed of wetlands like mudflats, mangroves, swamps, uh, and savannas uh, that stretch from the estuary of the Sinamara River to the Irakubo River, which is located 70 kilometers west of Koro, about 40 miles away. Um, so over there, you could find uh, a Maison de la Nature, so uh, uh, like nature, house of nature, nature museum, uh, which is a museum space with exhibitions about the local flora and fauna that you can find uh, in this area, uh, as well as an aquarium and a vivarium to observe marsh fishes and animals. So over there, there's actually a 2.5, like 1.5, Sorry, sorry, 2.5 kilometer, 1.5 mile uh, footpath that has been constructed through the marshes from the House of Nature to some uh, towers and observatories in the protected area. So uh, from those observatories, you could maybe spot some uh, giant otters, capybaras, bush dogs, monkeys, and numerous species of birds, including uh, scarlet ibises, snail kites and different species of ducks. And so you can actually uh, visit this, uh, this natural uh, reserve uh, on a canoe or, or a kayak. If you want to enter uh, a bit further in the land, uh, you could visit Cacao Village, uh, which is located about 100 kilometers southeast of Kuru, so 60 miles away. 
And so, yeah, like 60 kilometers away from Cayenne, basically. Um, so it's a uh, Hmong village. Uh, actually, France helped some refugees from Laos to, mig to migrate there uh, in French Guiana in the late 1970s, uh, mostly to cultivate fruits and vegetables in this specific area. So uh, this community of uh, Hmong people uh, built uh, traditional Laotian housing, uh, houses on sills, and developed a very important vegetable market. And they are still now the major food producers in Guyenne. Uh, so Cacao Village is actually the departure point uh, to explore the Amazonian forests. Go there with a guide. If you ever go there, you don't want to be lost in the Amazon forever. Uh, so you can uh, start visiting the uh, Amazonian forest as well. Once again, with a guy, either by foot following uh, the Molokai path or by canoe on the Conte River that goes through the, the forests. In Cacao as well, you would find the Museum of Insects called Le Planeur Bleu. Uh, and over there, they have 350,000 species presented, as well as Native American pottery and artifacts. So among the species of uh, insects that you could see, like butterflies, tarantulas as well. I know it's not an insect, but like tarantulas are very common in French Guiana. So the main cultural events uh, that happen that's very, very important in Guyane is the French Guiana Carnival. And it's actually the longest carnival in the world, uh, which lasts for about two months from uh, the Epiphany in early January to Ash Wednesday. So every, every Sunday, uh, you would have some uh, people uh, dancing and uh, parading with marching bands uh, for two months every Sunday. Um, <clears throat> So every Friday or Saturday, or Saturday as well, depending on the city, there are masquerade balls where um, Toulouse, uh, like a specific character from the Guyan, French Guyanese festival, invite men to dance with them and men can't refuse. And so those masquerade balls are very specific to French Guyana's festivals, uh, to French Guyana's carnival. You wouldn't find them uh, in Guadeloupe or in Martinique, for example, there are not a component uh, of the, the uh, lesser anti uh, carnivals. So parading as well, you would find some traditional characters like Toulouse, which are um, like costumes representing um, like bourgeois kind of noble uh, slave owners. Uh, Negmarons, like slaves who, ex who escaped, Lanmo, like death, or Jeffarin, uh, people dressed in white uh, who throw flower on the audience. So the characters, traditional characters that would parade uh, in uh, French Guiana Carnival are actually very rooted um, in slavery from the 18th and uh, from the 18th and 19th century. And Ash Wednesday, which is the biggest uh, day of the carnival, so you would have a three hour long great parade of the coast on the coast um, that actually happens in Kou, uh, which lasts, as I said, three hours and more. So, uh, and as well as the burning of uh, the giant puppet King Vavel. So this tradition is actually common to uh, other carnivals like the one in Martinique and the one in Dunkirk that I talked about in a previous presentation. So like, yeah, for this carnival as well, you would actually burn uh, a giant puppet at the very end of the carnival. So during this uh, parade, uh, the three hour long parade, uh, women dance or dressed as Tululu, men dance and play music like drums and kids uh, dressed as little devils. Uh, play instruments uh, while they are parading. So here you have a, a bit more images of the French Guinness Carnival. So those are Toulouse. So like a yeah, very like fancy, I would say, like kind of mocking the, the aristocracy 
um, of the uh, 19th century, like it kind of reminds um, uh, reminds a bit of the uh, Carnival of Venice, like yeah, for the kind of masks that that you would see. Um, so for this carnival as well, so this started as a as a tradition that mixed um, culture from uh, West Africa, uh, where the slaves were coming from, as well as European traditions, um, like uh, of countries where slave owners were coming from. So what can you eat when you are in French Guiana? So you could try the awara broth, um, which is uh, an Easter uh, an Easter dish, so like yeah, something that you would eat mm, close to Easter. So awara is a tropical food, uh, and so awara broth is a stew made of the pulp of the, the awara awara foods, uh, mixed with smoked meat or smoked fish, as well as vegetables like cabbage, spinach, peppers, green beans, and eggplants. And it takes up to 36 hours to prepare the dish. It's often served with white rice. So uh, as a generality, um, French Guyanese cuisine uh, is inspired by African, Indian, and Native American cuisines. And the most common ingredient that you would find is cassava. Second dish that you could eat is kalalu, also called kalu. Uh, so it finds its origins in West and Central Africa. It's mostly made of leaf vegetables like taro, amaranth, or spinach, uh, as well as okras uh, and smoked meat, mostly pork or chicken, uh, and free fish or shrimps or even crab. Uh, and with that, you add tomato, herbs, and peppers, uh, including cayenne peppers. And so this dish is also eaten during Easter. You could also try pimentade, which is a fish or meat broth with tomato sauce and cayenne pepper, once again, uh, usually served with rice or quack, which is a kind of semolina. And for dessert, you could uh, try the contes. Um, which is a kind of biscuit, like short, uh, small shortbread cake, uh, somewhat sweet uh, that it accompanies fruit sorbet or fruit salads. So that's all for today. I hope that you uh, enjoy this session. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or ask them in the chat. I'm here to answer them if you, yeah, if you can think of anything if you, something attracted your curiosity. If not, no problem at all. Uh, our next stops will be Lyon, Marseille and Nice. So this time we will stay more in the um, southeast of France. Are rising sea levels a particular concern of Ile de Ré? Um, that's a good question. I think it tends to be more and more, especially with global warming. Um, I think recently there's been a, a study, um, maybe in, in the last few years, I can't really remember, uh, about all the territories that would be concerned by raising sea levels. And I think that Ile de Ré is definitely part of these territories. Uh, how do we find past tours on YouTube? I missed last week. Uh, so the one from last week hasn't been uploaded yet on the YouTube channel, uh, but let me see. Uh, let me see. Uh, I can send you the link. So um, you would find them on the Princeton Public Library channel. Uh, so if you just type Princeton Public Library, uh, discovering friends, uh, you would find them. But so yeah, the last one uh, hasn't been uploaded yet. Uh, we're just waiting for a colleague to come back from vacation to upload it on the YouTube channel. But the, I think the first two ones should be on YouTube. 
So yeah, thank you for your comments. And yeah, I really appreciate it. And so yeah, I'm looking forward to talk to you about the next three cities. I actually lived in Lyon, even though it was during COVID, I couldn't enjoy it as much as I could, but like, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about those three cities next week. And so yeah, if you have any other questions, I'm always available at the library through email or phone. You can email the ref staff at princetonlibrary.org uh, email and my colleagues will uh, transmit your questions to me. And so yeah, if nothing comes to mind, let's see you next week for a, a new session. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Bye, merci. Mm -hmm. Merci. Thank you. My pleasure.